Sharice Johnston is a well-rounded interior architecture and business professional with 30 years experience in design practice management, strategic planning, marketing research and small business management. She is also the former chair of the National Board of Directors of the American Society of Interior Designers the world's largest and oldest professional association of interior design. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the DAS stage, Sharice Johnston. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, Marlene, we're like old friends now. I've given this talk at a, a couple of the smaller DAS conferences, but just like that song, New York, New York, um, you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So thank you, Joe Berg, for having me. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the blurring of lines between commercial and residential spaces. And it's something that I'm sure you've all noticed, too, in the last several years. Um, you don't have to be an architect or an interior designer to notice that lots of spaces are starting to look like our homes now. And rather than just chalk it up to a trend like lime green or Edison bulbs. Um, I'm a super geek, so I had to try and look into maybe there were some more reasons behind it. Maybe there were some sociological reasons or economic reasons. Um, and I came up with some ideas, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. What we're going to do today is touch on four main sections. First, we're going to play a game that I call Name This Space. I'm going to show you some pretty pictures. And then we're going to examine some common building typologies and discuss why they're overlapping and blending, how they came to be and what's going on with them. Then we'll review some current and some speculative trends that continue to influence um, building archetypes. And then finally, we'll end up with some implications for interior design. Here we go. This is my first of my pretty pictures. What does this look like to you? To me, it looks like a really sci-fi library, like in a movie or something. But it actually exists. Oops. It's the Dropbox headquarters. Now let's look at this picture. This is unmistakably a bar, right? But it's a bar in an office. Not my office. Some office in Singapore. Now here, this has got to be an office. You, you, you see the workstations, you see the people working. But I think you've caught on by now. It's not an office, it's a school. It's in Chicago. Now this looks like a school. If you squint and you don't notice these are millennials, they, they could be a creche, right? <laughs> but it's Airbnb in San Francisco. I'm not kidding you. This looks like a very high-end mall, the sort of place that I'm too intimidated to go in with tall, skinny, snooty uh, salespeople. Burberry, Tiffany, Max Mara. But it's at the Melbourne airport, so anybody can go there. To me, this looks like a fancy lounge, like a club. After all, the, the alcohol and the cigarette butts are swept up and before the band comes on for for the next night, right? You're, you're never going to guess what this is. I'm just going to tell you. It's a student lounge for some really spoiled brats in England. And here we have a coffee shop, because people are drinking coffee. And you can see the barista in the back and the um, chalkboard with the specials, Pete's Coffee. But if you look on the left, it says Capital One, and that's a bank. It's a bank in Miami, Florida. OK, here is, it looks like a really sweet hotel room. But look, there's a crib in it, and there's a tub. So those are hints. It's a birthing center. I think it used to be right here in Johannesburg. I think it closed down, but I couldn't resist using this photo. And here's the last of my pretty photos. This now has to be a hotel, right? It's just too hip, too cool, with the pool table and everything but it's a tenant lounge in a commercial high-rise building in Chicago. So what's going on here? Um, what happened to these distinct archetypes? Why are these spaces blending? 
Once upon a time, you could easily figure out the function of a space just by looking at a picture of it. And we could consult books like these for formulas on how to lay out commercial spaces. And that was, there was a very simple reason for that, and that is that building types evolved from their function. And that function was dictated by the building's owner. And what motivates a building's owner to make money, so they want to keep costs as low as possible, and operational efficiency to make it easy to operate. So let's look at commercial offices, for example. Around the turn of the century, the early 1900s, because of the Industrial Revolution and time and motion studies, corporate offices were set up like factories to maximize productivity. So just like production lines, office space was organized sequentially. But instead of moving widgets from one person to another, they shuffled paper. So you can see here, like a factory, except these men, all men, are much better dressed. They sat in the middle, and then they were supervised by management who sat in the private offices around the perimeter. So this continued for several decades until 1967, when something revolutionary happened cubicles. They were introduced by Herman Miller, and um, it, it was revolutionary because they could pretend to give people private offices without building walls so people could have some privacy, but it was also very efficient because it was a kit of parts that could be reconfigured multiple ways, and so management could shift people or groups as they see fit and save money by reusing the parts. And by the 1990s, Cubicle farms came to epitomize the soulless nature of corporate work. Like the, there was a comic strip called Dilbert and a very funny movie called Office Space. And if you haven't seen that, go, go find that on Netflix this weekend. Now starting in the 2000s, benching systems became very popular because of three factors. First of all, real estate costs skyrocketed. So uh, employers had to squeeze more people into less space. Second of all, if you have lower panel heights or no panels, you saved a lot of money. And also you could earn points on the building, new building rating systems at the time, like LEED and BREEAM, because employees could have a view to the outdoors. And then third, open plans supposedly encouraged more interaction and collaboration, which we all know now is not true, but that's another story. We'll get to that later. So benching seems suspiciously to me like factories, right? Because once again, it's one big long desk and cramming people in there. And that has evolved to modern Silicon Valley cliche like this picture of Facebook. So we'll turn now to education. Schools were also designed to maximize efficiency, especially in rural areas where teachers, books, and other materials were scarce Students of all ages were gathered together to face one real stern-looking mama of a school teacher. And just like in offices, classrooms were designed to maximize the number of students per instructor. And you know, that model, all seats facing front, be quiet, don't fidget, persists today in most countries all over the world. And the idea of teaching is still one way, to funnel a predetermined um, curriculum of information into students' heads and to keep them quiet. Um, and this actually has quite a bit of room between the, uh, the aisleways. In lots of classrooms, it's, it's quite squeezed in there. Now, when we talk about retail, once upon a time, you had the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. And on marketing day, you'd take your list, right, and you'd go to the store, and when it was your turn, uh, you get to the front of the line, you'd hand your list to the store owner, and then he or she or her assistants would run around and package up, you know, pork chops or a kilo of flour or whatever. And then you took your stuff and you went home. Then, in 1929, the first supermarket opened. And that was revolutionary. And, and when I was researching this, I learned that the first pick and pay opened in South Africa in 1967. And, it, and the first one was right down the street where I live now in Cape Town. And my husband still remembers this. That's how you know how old he is. He was very excited. He and his mom were very excited when it opened. And pick and pay is a perfect name because instead of 
the um, shopkeeper picking, the customer picked and then paid. And this completely upended the, the operations of the store. Because of manufacturing advances, items could be packaged individually into preset sizes, the most popular sizes, and put on shelves. A greater variety of products could be displayed. And in essence, the aisles themselves became the specialty stores. Then the shopkeeper could um, operate things at a much larger scale. Sales per square foot would be much, much higher. And labor costs per square foot would be much lower because instead of people running around to pick stuff, they could be receiving stuff in the back, stocking shelves, or ringing up purchases. And now, of course, things are absolutely out of control, especially with warehouse stores, which this isn't because in a warehouse store, everything is packaged up. But now the, the whole um, competitive advantage is lower prices, lower prices. And when the warehouse clubs first opened in 1960s, um, people couldn't believe it. It was absolutely no frills, but now we're pretty used to it. And now that barcodes have replaced price tags, you, you sometimes don't see a person at all when you go into some of these warehouse clubs. Now, that doesn't mean that individual shops have disappeared. They tend to um, appear in one of three situations. One, where it's a very specialty type of goods that they're offering. Two, if they're in small towns, that the large stores just don't find it profitable to go into, or three, in really luxury markets. This is Fifth Avenue in New York, and I think all of Singapore <laughs> looked like this when I visited there. So now we'll touch on a few other instantly recognizable building typologies that still persist. And this, of course, is a bank. It serves the greatest number of people per teller. Uh, you queue up in front of a teller, just like at the supermarket. There are wide open sight lines for security, and the perimeter areas are for more wealthy clients with, um, that take longer time to talk to their bankers. Hospitals. This you recognize immediately, too. Hospitals are designed to maximize the number of patients that can be served by nurses. There's usually wide, hard, noisy hallways but that are easy to navigate and that are easy to clean. And the shared rooms are for regular people. And if you're wealthy, you can have a private room. So there's research, a lot of research coming out now about how the acoustics and the light level are actually impeding your ability to heal. And so uh, hospitals are changing now, especially NICUs where premature babies are. Uh, they've changed a lot, but hos hospitals are a little slow to to change from this operational efficiency point of view. And here's the worst. I tried to find the worst looking airport picture I could. I spent too much time here. But we've all, we, we all know about this. Talk about efficiency. We're trying, they're trying to move the greatest number of people through security, funnel them as efficiently and as quickly as possible to gates that are organized by plane size and destinations. And then you're grouped at the gate like, in a, in a, like cattle and you're moved on and off as quickly as possible. So with all these archetypes, the focus again was on the operator to save the money and to maximize efficiency. But then a bunch of things happened in the last couple of decades that has shifted the balance of power from the operator to the user. Suddenly the customer, that's us, we are now the focus. Perhaps the biggest change is technology faster computers, smartphones, and the ability to communicate globally has completely changed the way in which we lived, in which we live. Um, one of the most important implications is increased competition for talent, for goods, for services. Tasks that were once limited to certain types of spaces can now be done anywhere. Talent can be found and accessed globally. There are now no geographic or time constraints. And information and services that were once available only to the wealthy or to corporations are now available to individuals. The Great Recession also happened, which caused massive job losses and a glut of empty offices. People realized they couldn't depend on companies anymore to, to give them a job. So they started their own jobs or they started freelancing. And they began working out of their homes and in coffee shops. and on planes, trains, anywhere. So these pundits came out with all these predictions that the office is dead. 
there's going to be no more offices. But as we all know, that's not true. It hasn't and will not happen because, frankly, we're all human. We, we crave human connections. That's why we're all here today instead of on a webinar, right? Um, well, also because of the, the Nespresso, <laughs> right? That's why we're here today. Um, what has evolved is the purpose of the office. It's no longer the place you go only to get work done. It's the place you go to interact with other people. And research has shown that the traditional corporate offices, which is one chair per butt, uh, private offices around the window and, and cubes in the middle, is just totally outdated. It no longer fits today's work. In fact, by the end of this year, the predictions are that 50%, half of all office workers, will be remote. And by 2030, that's only another 10 years from now, 30% of corporate office portfolios will be flexible workspaces. Here's another trend, social media. It's another trend that has eroded the line between work and home. And what started as something fun for kids to do has now become an indispensable um, part of our marketing arsenal as, as companies. Facebook is still king with over 2 billion, that's billion with a B, monthly active users. But Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, and YouTube, which is owned by Google, are both growing twice as fast. So what I find the most fascinating, not just these huge numbers with a lot of zeros after them, is how many people are going onto the sites, especially kids, and they're creating and uploading content. So they're not just digesting it, but they're creating it and sharing it themselves. 57, okay, this is from last year, it's probably higher now. 57% of teenagers create and share blog posts, photos, and videos, often about stuff that adults may find silly, stupid, or embarrassing. My, um, my stepdaughter was three, she took a picture of her dad in a bathrobe and uploaded it to Instagram without him noticing, and it got like a gazillion likes. So combined with the Kardashians, there's now a huge generational and cultural shift. Stuff that was once only done or talked about at home or with your friends is now considered entertainment and appropriate to be shared with millions of strangers. And that means that the division between private and public is no longer clear, let alone sacred. Shopping. The shopping experience has also been upended and democratized. Thanks to Amazon, you can order just about anything online and have it delivered almost instantaneously. So when people ask me, um, what do you miss most about the US, and they think I, I'm going to say my kids, no, it's Amazon Prime. <laughs> Amazon Prime, there are 10 million products eligible for next day or two day delivery. It's, it's, it, it can make one very, very spoiled. Amazon overall is responsible for almost half now of US e-commerce sales. And there's also Target, or Target, as some people like to say. Before Target, we assumed that only rich people could afford well-designed, hip things, and the rest of us had to be satisfied with generic or ugly stuff. But then Target came out with its Design for All program, and it started partnering with um, chic product designers and industrial designers. And today, you know, regular people can buy a sweater designed by Vera Wang or sleep on Miss Sony sheets. And that demand for good design translates from the home into student housing, into offices, frankly, into hospitals, and senior living. That's a huge, huge market that requires um, not only great design, but, you know, the marrying of research and design. But I'm, I'm again, digressing. <laughs> So now, when images travel instantly around the world, and you can get anything everywhere, things start to look the same. I got this from a magazine, an online magazine called Verge. I just, I just thought this totally made the point. One thing that happens is the ubiquity and sameness in style. And Verge magazine blames this on Airbnb. They say that we are eager to um, travel all around the world, but we're actually really lame because we, we seek out places that look like home or look like our aspirational views of home. So the places that get rented out the most tend to look the same. And you know, you get your 
Eames chairs, you get the uh, brick walls and Edison bulbs and, and live edge wood tables. And if I never see any of those again, it'll be too soon. Another effect when there is a demand for a look is the rise of cheap knockoffs. And I have to admit, we designers are part of this problem because rather than educating <coughs> customers about what is true quality, and rather than spending the time to find individual creative resources locally, it's much too easy to give in and buy a cheap knockoff. But I'll stop my sermon there. All of these factors I just talked about have combined to put the user in the driver's seat. As I said, the power has flipped from the building operator to the worker, the traveler, the shopper, the student. And this user focus affects every single type of space you can imagine, but how it's expressed spatially depends on the market. When it comes to workplace and education, users are looking for choice and flexibility. And this is an image from Herman Miller. They have um, 10 different workplace settings as part of its living office program that can be adapted to individual company needs. Now, as we said before, offices are not just places to work anymore. They're places for people to get together. But they also have to be physical representations of a company's brand and identity, which are crucial in today's battle for talent. 45% of employers worldwide say they are struggling to fill open positions, especially for knowledge workers. And recruiting them is only half the battle. Now you have to worry about the employees staying, because when half of your employees leave every two years, you are spending a lot of your time and money on recruiting them and re replacing them and training them. So you can see here, um, among millennials, 43% expect to leave within two years. And Gen Z, 61% expect to leave your firm within two years. Research has proven that people's workplaces have a direct impact on their engagement. And the more engaged they are, the less likely they are, they are to leave. So yeah, besides the climbing wall, the free uh, cold brewed coffee, being able to bring your dog to work, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the stuff that, that you see that gets a lot of press. <clears throat> but beyond the eye candy, one of the most important factors to engagement is choice. The ability to pick where you work, depending on the task to be done. You know, what resources do you need? How many people are you working with? How much time? Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we all have different preferences for uh, visual and acoustic privacy. The type of activity that's required, whether, whether you're writing something, you're making calls, you're um, brainstorming or you're working with other people. And then the physical parameters of the space, the temperature, the amount of light, and this is my favorite one, the proximity to food. <laughs> In fact, the big corner office is no longer the badge of prestige. Now it's choice and the coolest gadgets. And in a lot of the meetings I used to have in California, the most powerful person in the room was the youngest guy who looked like a slob who came in late and was carrying the latest phone. And that's who knew who really had the power. And he didn't even have an office. <clears throat> so that image that I showed earlier of Facebook, one big open office of benching workstations just no longer cuts it because it's too loud, too distracting, too chaotic. So you don't have to read the words here. You can just kind of look at the image which is of a uh, floor, and you can see there's just different layouts on the floor. It's not just a sea of workstations. This is Steelcase's version of living office. There are individual layouts, um, I mean, uh, various layouts, such as individual workspaces, focus rooms, open conference spaces, big eating spaces. The idea is a palette of place, so you could pick where you want it work. And that's one of the reasons that co-working spaces are so popular, is because you're not tethered to a particular seat or a desk, and you don't get that nasty side eye from your boss if you don't happen to be at your desk. Co-working spaces first appeared in 2005, and by last year, there were 20,000 co-working spaces all over the world. WeWork, putting aside all the recent scandal about WeWork, really was a fascinating and very successful concept. It started in 2008 by converting cheap 
unused office space into really hip hangouts for startups. And it morphed into not just operating co-working spaces, but becoming a competitor to designers. It started designing and building and even managing offices for Fortune 500 companies. By last year, they served 400,000 members in 27 countries. And this is something that amazed me. In Manhattan, it was Manhattan's largest office tenant, was WeWork. But co-working isn't just for startups anymore. Now they're an acceptable alternative office space for large corporations or for people with a specific focus, like working parents. They'll have a um, working parent, one with a crush attached to it, and classes um, for parenting, or social responsibility firms, or ones for women, et cetera. So again, it's about social engagement. And co-working spaces um, also have really fun rooms. This is a golf simulator, but it's, this actually isn't in co-working. This is in one of those tenant office spaces in a commercial office building where the building owners, in order to attract tenants, are just stumbling over each other. They call it an office amenity arms race. So you find golf, um, golf simulators, game rooms, themed social events after work. Um, I've personally designed gyms and meditation rooms private focus spaces, event spaces, all for office buildings to offer the employees who work in that building. So now having a choice also applies to education. This is from a, a company called Technion that um, produces office furniture and education furniture. New teaching methods emphasize that we all learn differently. So there's no one size fits all way to teach students. And so these teaching methods must be tailored to the individual student. And sometimes the one teacher or two teachers in control of a room have many, many different types of teaching going on at the same time. So they need to be able to reconfigure their classroom depending on the activity, whether it's individually based learning, um, small groups, lecture, they're building models or working on experiments. So they're looking for flexible um, furniture and also, incidentally, the ideal classroom these days isn't a rectangle with a front and a back. It's a square with all, well, at least one um, wall of windows to the outside, to nature if possible, and then the other three with technology and boards. And the teacher has changed from being a teacher to more of a, of a coach. That's the model. In retail and hospitality, the focus has also moved from operational efficiency to user experience. But the key factors there are not flexibility and choice. We have too many choices already that all blend into each other, and customers are becoming fickle and jaded. So rather than more choices, stores, restaurants, and hotels now want to create wonderfully memorable, personalized experiences. This is a quote from another marketing brochure. To cut through the clutter and build customer loyalty. Experiential retail is another buzzword, and it's about making an emotional connection. And we've all learned that, after all, it's experiences that we remember and appreciate more than stuff. So here's an example of really good company, I mean, really good experiential retail experience by a company called Canada Goose. Now, Canada Goose, like Montclair and North Face, they make very, very expensive and chic parkas. I don't know how a parka can be chic, but um, a couple of years ago, there was a Sports Illustrated supermodel <clears throat> wearing a bikini and a Montclair parka. I don't know what that's about, but it sold a lot of parkas. But then somebody got the great idea that it wasn't enough to position itself like a prestigious fashion brand that had a lot of functionality. Because in order to... Um, teach people about functionality, what you usually do, right? You hire smart salespeople and you educate them so that they can spout off all the technical detail. And then you kit out your websites so that it has a ton of detail on there too. But in this case, some genius said, instead of convincing people how warm our parkas keep you under different temperatures, why not just build big freezers in the stores? So that's what they did. They built like big milk, um, meat lockers. They called them cold rooms. And, you, and they can be adjusted in temperature from minus 18 to minus 25 degrees centigrade. And then the salesperson hands you different parkas so you can try them out. 
whether you're in a bikini or not is up to you. Um, and then best of all, you can take selfies and, and post them. And it's not that crazy, you know, um, um, expensive or crazy an idea, but it was brilliant. And um, sales just skyrocketed. And Fast Company called it the best retail experience of 2018. And For Forbes named Canada Goose one of the brands to watch for 2019. Because it combined fun with usefulness, it brought people into the store, and it allowed salespeople to not only tell the story, but also to build relationships. <clears throat> in Los Angeles, there is a shopping center called Century City. And it was built in 1964. And um, it, it, foot traffic became less and less. Uh, um, auto traffic really declined. And they decided they were going to give this um, shopping center a makeover. And they invested a billion dollars into it, $1 billion, which sounds crazy, right? But it totally paid off. One year later, annual sales had doubled from $600 million to $1.25 billion in one year. The number of visitors also doubled to $25 million a year. And there's, it's not even that big. It's not like the Mall of America, which has you know, amusement parks and everything <laughs> attached to it. It's, just, it's, it's an outdoor mall. So how did they do this? They came up with another pretty simple concept. They treated everybody like a VIP, like a movie star. So you drive up, you can reserve a private parking space if you want. You can visit a boxing studio, go to live concerts and events. Um, there's a virtual reality entertainment center. You can just walk around and get an ice cream for not much money at all and have a really fun day. So what you see here is obviously a restroom, right? You look, at the, look at the marble. Um, the tiles. This is designed by Kelly Wersler, who's a, a very famous hospitality designer. But this isn't a restroom in a hotel. These are public restrooms. And they have really nice hand towels, too. So anybody can go in there and use it. Um, this is a picture I took when I was there about a year ago, a store called Malin and Getz. And I did a little double take because they have little doggy biscuits out that say Malin and Getz on them. So even your chihuahua, like Paris Hilton, you know, can get the Paris Hilton chihuahua uh, uh, treatment there. And a picture that I didn't show that I should have put in there is um, from another, another store that's called Aesop that sells really expensive, very artisanally made lotions and skincare stuff. And they're known for um, kind of minimalist, really cool spaces that are different in cities all over the world. So it's kind of intimidating to go in because everything's laid out beautifully. So they did something that I thought was brilliant. They built in a little niche just outside the front door, outside the door, a display for lotions. So they took their fancy lotions and they put them outside so you didn't have to go inside to test them. And when I was there, there was a whole family, like grandpa to little kid, and they were there pumping the lotions and putting it on and smelling each other's hands. And what a way to you know, have some fun, build an experience, and entice people to come into the store. <clears throat> in travel, uh, we've all heard of Airbnb. You know, they started as a, as a place um, to connect people who were looking for a couch to crash on, and now you know, entire cities and their tax, tax bases are being upended because of Airbnb. And uh, a couple of years ago, they decided to um, move from just giving people a place to stay into providing entertainment. So as people seek authenticity and purpose in their travel, they now have the op uh, option to participate in things like group yoga classes on the beach or to forage for plants to make their own designer cocktails or their own perfumes. So now let's switch from specific design drivers to some big trends that will further blur the lines between building typologies. Sensor technology, smart homes. By the end of this year, there will be 20 billion connected sensors and endpoints. Amazon now owns Alexa, Echoes, and Whole Foods. So soon you'll be able to get a refrigerator that monitors how much milk you have and then automatically orders it when you run low and have it delivered. Um, 
Last year, there was a story. Now, I don't know if it's true, because maybe it was debunked, but I just thought it was hysterical about a girl who was grounded by her mom. <laughs> and she, uh, she had her phone taken away. She had her Nintendo taken away, her Wii taken away. It was like she was in jail, right? But she ended up tweeting from the refrigerator, from an LG refrigerator. <laughs> um, our spaces are becoming integrated with health monitoring technology which will sense our pulse, our respiration, our weight, our movement, and usage patterns. It's like our houses are becoming Fitbits. Uh, and, and one thing that's true and that's actually on the market now is a carpet that has sensors built into it. So you can have it installed in your, in your mom's, you know, like your mom's home, uh, older people, your grandma's home. And it doesn't just detect a fall, it detects if she's walking differently, to be able to detect if somebody's had a stroke. And that way, you can um, look after her right away and alert her caregivers. Here's something else. Um, every year, IKEA commissions a very detailed research study of how people think of home. And in 2018, they came out with some really fascinating conclusions and findings. Okay. You ready for this? 29% of people worldwide, not just in the US or in Sweden, 29% of people say they feel more at home in places other than where they live. And that number jumps to 35% for people who live in cities. So they feel more at home, not at home. To get some time alone, one out of four people go elsewhere. They don't go home. To, feel, to, to be alone. And that number is 45% 45, uh, 45 of Americans, when they want to be alone, they go to their car. And I'm one of those people. Because when I commuted in Los Angeles, that was the only time I could totally feel like nobody was bothering me. 21% of respondents between the ages of 18 and 24 say they feel a sense of belonging more in their virtual communities rather than in their homes. So that kind of sounds kind of sad, right? They, they um, find a sense of belonging with people that they know online more than the people they live with. But before we go too crazy about millennials or Gen Ys and Gen Zs, let's look at some of the economic and demographic factors why. A lot of people work from home now, so they're bringing the stress from work to home with them. People are getting married and having kids later, which means they tend to have more roommates who may or may not be their friends. They may just be roommates. If you're unemployed, you can't find a job. You tend to live with your parents. And if money is really tight and you can't afford childcare, maybe you're, the grandparents are living with you as well. And to make money, people are renting out their homes on Airbnb. So the thought occurred to me, maybe home is not a building or a single space, but it's a state of mind and it's created by a network of places. So we've all heard of co-working. Now there's co-living. It's a new phenomenon. This is a place in Paris. And if you're already working 24-7 and you're hanging out with the people that you work in, you really just need a, a place to crash in your own bathroom. And then you can work and have fun all the time, right? At least for younger people, it's like a version of um, a dorm crossed with co-working. And for their parents, a lot of them feel that um, it's keeping them safe. And I think it's just delaying adulthood a little longer, but that's just me. And young people are showing that they value flexibility and freedom over ownership, giving away to the sharing or on-demand economy. So because of Uber, they're ditching cars. They no longer feel the need to own cars. Um, because of Rent the Runway and other subscription services, you can switch out your wardrobe with meal packages and meal delivery like you cook here. You don't need to have big refrigerators or ovens at all. And that's why offices, student housing, and apartments, you really need storage lockers now for deliveries. And that's why kitchens are downsizing. And some of the hugest kitchens you see in homes are actually just for show. And what you see here is an app and it looks like an app for a store of stuff. But what it is, is, is an app for your storage. You can put everything you own in storage, and then when you need it, 
You just press a button on the app and they'll deliver it to you. So if you can store everything you own and have it delivered to you when you need it, you can not only save a lot of space, but in theory, you don't even need to rent or buy a home or have a permanent home address. This is a co-living, co-working place in Bali that's part of a network called Rome. Not R-O-M-E, Rome, R-O-A-M. It's targeted at today's young digital nomads. And according to their website, they, they provide you everything you need to feel at home and be productive from the moment you arrive. Strong, battle-tested Wi-Fi, a co-working space, chef's kitchen, and a diverse community. And I love that uh, they put food above, I mean Wi-Fi above food. And why do you necessarily need things delivered to your home or office? Amazon now works with nine different car manufacturers to deliver straight into the trunk of your car. And if you're not tethered to a home, then little delivery bots can bring all your stuff straight to where you are. And this is an entire store that comes to you. It's the size of a, of a large car. And it's not sci-fi. It's actually been up and running in Shanghai for more than two years now. It's self-driving, remote-controlled, robotic store that requires no staff. It's open 24 hours a day. You can find a video of it on YouTube. And you know, instead of just stores, I think this has real um, implications for getting uh, healthy foods, fruits and vegetables to communities that may not have access to that. So if you extrapolate on those trends, what if the whole city is your home? And instead of um, a, a membership to a gym, you have a membership to spaces and a menu of buildings. So depending on your mood and what you feel like doing that day, you move throughout the whole city. So if you want to have a party, you rent out a penthouse. If you're working on your book, you rent out a little cottage. And so it's a palette of place, like at the office, but on a ginormous urban scale. So there's no longer home ownership, but a living membership. So now we come to the end of, and some thoughts I wanna, I wanna leave you with. When home is a state of mind, that means everyone has a different idea of home. When work and entertainment and learning and shopping all blend together 24 seven, and spaces around the world all start to look the same, you can't just go to a book or rely on traditional building types to guide your design. And when mass personalization is possible through technology, everybody expects something unique. So some lessons for the future, and these are my opinion, but I hope you'll take some time to think about them. I think that as designers and architects, we must be generalists and humanists, and there's no such thing as staying in your own lane anymore. We can't possibly know everything a user needs when their needs are changing and blending all the time. And because technology is changing so fast and buildings are getting so complicated, we, we need all the help we can get and we need to listen. To relate to users, we have to observe them and we have to empathize. We shouldn't presuppose anything or just trot out the same old, same old, but we must approach projects with fresh eyes. To connect with clients, we must understand what drives them and help them envision how their lives will improve with better design. We can better convey design concepts through storytelling rather than using complicated jargon that they just don't understand. In this day and age of digital worlds um, and virtual connections, authentic experiences are king. And that means engaging the senses, not just through pretty pictures, but with tactility and smells and sounds and even temperature. And most importantly, we have to work together in multidisciplinary teams with engineers, technology specialists, psychologists, clients, gerontologists, et cetera, to create spaces that truly improve lives and not just get a bunch of likes on Instagram. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. And I hope you had as much fun as I did putting this together. Thank you, thank you so much, Cerise.